In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Acts chapter 3, we'll begin reading out of verse 1. Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. Acts 3 and verse 1. When you found it, say amen. If you're looking at the screen and cheating, say amen. Yeah, that's what I thought. Carry your Bibles. That's all I'll say. Carry your Bible. Hallelujah. Acts 3 and verse 1. Follow along as I read. Now Peter and John went up together. Say that word. Say together. Into the temple at the ninth. Or at the, excuse me, at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look, on us say those words say look on us and the blind man gave heed unto them or the broken man the sick man the diseased man you can really insert anyone here gave heed he acknowledged that they possessed something he was in desperate need of and the lame man gave heed unto them expecting to receive something of them. Say that, say expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I'd like to minister for a few moments tonight on a subject entitled, When Lame Expectations Encounter Apostolic authority when lame expectations encounter apostolic authority let the power of the Holy Ghost fill this house tonight Jesus I pray that someone's life would be dramatically altered by the preached word of God. Oh, by the authority of the name of Jesus in which I'm sent and the sovereignty of the gift of the Spirit that lives in me. I lose faith in this house tonight. Ah, I lose healings, deliverances, breakthroughs, miracles in the name of Jesus. I decree it and declare it to be so. Fill someone with the gift of the Spirit tonight, Lord, as only you can. Oh, resurrect someone's faith, release someone's spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the house said, Amen. You may be seated. The first rays of light are shattering the darkness that has shrouded humanity for eons. Desperate and alone, no longer. The church is alive. Jerusalem is reeling from the aftershocks of a spiritual awakening in her streets. The status quo is being challenged. Tradition is usurped. The foundation of ancient ritual is being shattered in the whirlwind of spiritual transformation. The streets are chaos. The talk of the town it's not simply the ritual and the tradition of the festival of weeks or Pentecost. But they speak of foreign tongues and drunken men. The priests stand with shocked expressions on their face. Their mouths agape at the rapid expansion of this Jesus experience. He's alive. That's the message. And shed abroad in the hearts of men. 
Jesus is not dead. He lives. He lives. He lives. This same Jesus whom ye crucified is alive in us. And that Jesus is disrupting the tradition. Religion is turned topsy-turvy. Jesus is changing lives, radically renovating the old and making it new. That Jesus, whom they thought they had conquered, lives. And tonight, your Jesus still changes lives. He still renovates the old. He still turns worlds upside down. This Jesus of ours, infinite, powerful, resourceful, divine, completely God, completely man. This God you worship, he's intelligent, full of wisdom, perfect in all his ways. He does not react, he acts. For if he reacted to the ever-changing vicissitudes of life, then the action that preceded his reaction would dominate him. And nothing dominates the God you worship. He's not surprised. He's not overwhelmed. He's never worried nor stressed. He knows the answer to every question before you pose it. He is God. There is no confusion nor anxiety within him. For how can you be confused when you know all, control all, and answer all? For Romans 11 and 36 said, In him and of him and through him are all things. That Jesus is alive in their hearts. Isaiah declared, he has already declared the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. He has never needed anything he did not already possess. There has never been a question he could not answer, nor a storm he could not calm, a sea he could not part, a mountain he could not move, a disease he could not cure, a devil he could not conquer. He is God. And that's who we worship. The word declared him to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Understand the simplicity of that sermon. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before there was sin, he was escape from sin. Before there was confusion, he was the peace in the midst of the storm. For before there was failure, he was an exit from the failure of sin. That's who we worship, and that's who lives in us as the expression of the Holy Ghost. No mountains, no diseases, no rocks he cannot throw. Nothing he cannot do. If you believe that, shout yes. yes. The Alpha and the Omega. That's the Greek equivalent of the letter A. Omega, the letter Z. In other words, he is the Alpha, the A, and the Z. He is whatever you need him to be. Whenever you need him to become what you need him to be. That's why God himself is at a loss for words when Moses poses a question to God that has never been brought to his attention. Who do I tell this self-appointed God King Pharaoh sent me? And God scratches his head. Although we understand God has no head. For God is a spirit. So he scratches his metaphorical head. And he ponders the unanswerable. For he tells you in the Holy Writ, I have searched all the heavens. And there is none like me. No, not one. And so as our God scratches. 
uses this metaphorical head. He says this. He says, hmm, if I say deliverance, no, that's not right. I'm much more than a deliverer. If I say healer, I'm so much more than a healer. If I say Savior, I'm much more than salvation. So what am I after all? And he answers his question. I am. The I am. Just tell Pharaoh. The God who is whatever he wants to be. Whenever he wants to be it. However he must manifest Tell him that God, the self-sustaining, that God, the self-fulfilling God, that self-sustaining, all-powerful, omnipotent God, tell him that God sent you. The blank check, the whatever I must be, whenever I must be it, that God, who can do all things, answer all questions, that God. And that's who lives in your spirit. They were singing about it tonight and it got me fired up during worship. They were singing that song and they said he's, I don't know the lyrics, wonderful, powerful, glorious, whatever it was. I just like the last line. He is. He is. That's why Hebrews 11 and 6 said this, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he Stop right there. Don't move on. Don't move past the semicolon written in the English language. You must believe that he is. What is God? Well, he's a healer to some tonight. He's a deliverer to others. He's a comfort and a peace. Salvation and attorney. A philosopher and a psychologist. Because whatever he is to you, he is something radically different to someone else. That's how big your God is. The word is literally means this, and this is the definition, and I quote, the word is, are you ready? It's this. It tells you it is absolutely mind-boggling. You ready? The word is. You can't even say the word is properly. Because the word is means that you occupy all phases of what you declare yourself to occupy. I can say I am a father. I cannot say I is a father. Well, I can say it, but it's improper because I have not always been a father. I am means I occupy that present position. I am a father. I is means I was what I declare myself to be yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It means this. You ready? Here's the definition. The actuality of reality is. That's why the writer said the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are saved because before you needed a strong tower he was a strong tower tomorrow when you don't need a strong tower he'll still be a strong tower because God is that's why the writer said if you want to please God with your faith you must believe that God is you have to come to the realization that God is whatever you need him to be whenever you need him to be it the name of the Lord is a strong tower in fact the writer said he is a very present help in time of trouble how do you get more present than present you're either there or you're not but God is a very present help because he's present where you need him to be present before you got to where you are i wish you understood who it was you worship tonight a very present help he's healing before you got sick He's financial provision before you spent your money. He's help before you got in trouble. He is a very present help. God is. Shout it with me. Say, God is. Tell someone what he is right now. That God. That God is alive in their hearts. And it's the first miracle of the New Testament church. The pressure of ministry is upon them. They have not operated 
and this power and this authority and dominion as of yet. They've only staggered down under the influence of his glorious presence. Self-imposed, unrealistic expectations perhaps. The demands of the people. And there's nothing like the demands of the people when you feel ill-equipped to deliver. It's the first miracle. Precedents and principles are about to be set. They do not have the personage of Jesus Christ. They're alone. The stakes could not be higher in Acts 3. Within the miraculous intervention in the life of the lame man is the dynamic of the working of the supernatural in the church. It's the law of first mention. It's the theological understanding that the first time a principle is introduced in Scripture, you must pay very close attention to the underlying facts and realities that surround that theological concept, for they will continue with it throughout the rest of Scripture and time. And we are about to learn in Acts 3 how the miraculous will function within the confines of the New Testament church. Something big is about to happen. This God of ours, of order and structure, is about to give you a glimpse of his eternal plan. A certain man lay daily. There had never been a day in this man's life when he had not been a burden on someone. He could not walk. He could not work. He was dependent upon the benevolence of someone else's success. Afflicted, alienated, impure, banished. A bystander to the affairs of society. All he could do was beg. Alms, alms. He repeated the word. A monotonous mantra day after day. Caught in this cycle of mind-numbing frustration. And disillusionment, familiarity and despair, hope had fled on the wings of cynicism long ago. But here comes the sandaled footfalls of apostolic authority about to encounter his lame expectations. You see, the lame man is nothing but a cameo of the human race. All men are born with no standing before God, lame. We stumble and we fall through our lives, possessing absolutely nothing of ourselves. And the very best of us, the most educated of us, are nothing more than a spiritual beggar lying outside the beautiful gate of a religion powerless to bring change. A religion, in his case, that boasted of her law and legitimacy, but was powerless when faced with the enormity of his condition. It found him a beggar, and it left him a panhandler. But here they come, two apostolic anointed men heading into a life filled with dread. Together. And Peter and John went up together. Peter and John, that, that's different. That's very different. No, it used to be Peter and Andrew. James and John. Now it's Peter and John. And, and, and Simon Peter, he's a doer. John, he's a dreamer. Simon Peter's a motivator. John, he's a mystic. Simon Peter has his feet on the rock. John has his head in the clouds. Simon Peter demands of the Lord, what must this man do? But John whispers to Peter in a moment of doubt, it's the Lord. John outruns Simon Peter to the tomb. But Simon Peter burst past that hesitant John, staggers into that empty tomb runs out with a shout on his lips. But not John. 
John steps in and looks at the strangely ordered grave clothes and ponders their significance. Different Peter and John. But the Holy Ghost has a way of bringing different people together. You see, there is a simple truth being established in Acts 3. We are better together than when we're apart. Our strength is based on unity. I'll say it again. The Holy Ghost has a way of bringing different people together. If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, some of you wouldn't even be friends with people you're sitting by right now. You have different interests, different hobbies. You live in different parts of the town. You work different jobs. But because of the Holy Ghost, it has brought you with your uniqueness together. And if we ever lose the power of unity, we lose a significant portion of apostolic authority. God has structured us in such a way that when we become divided and pitted against one another, we cannot operate in our proper power nor form. God has so fixed our faith that a greater degree of apostolic authority is released when different individuals get together. Tell your neighbor, say, we are better together. Matthew 18 and 19 speaks of this concept. For the, our Jesus said, and again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree, shall agree on earth and touching anything that they shall ask and it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. Above all else, the enemy fights agreement. The enemy is resistant to your ability to connect one to another. For when you and I agree, there is a release of apostolic anointing that happens no other way. Imagine what would happen if we believed that scripture right now. What would happen to cancer in this house? What would happen to diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease and back aches and fibromyalgia? What would happen to the frustrations and the despair, the depression and the anger that has calloused our spirits? What would happen if you and I simply believe that any two of us could agree. We wouldn't have time for the choir to sing. We wouldn't have time for the preacher to finish his message. We'd run in the back door say, I'm fighting hell. I need someone to agree with me. I need someone to grab my hand. I've got to have a breakthrough. What would happen in this place right now if you could find someone willing to partner with you that a miracle could be yours? If we could stop worrying about our divisions, our differences, and our frustrations. If we could move past the things that divide us. Enough with the anger, the frustrations that separate us. Acts 2 declared they were in one place and one accord. Implying by the writing of the author that God sent them waiting upon their spirits to unify. Suddenly there came a sound that radically transformed a city. When the choir begins to sing and the Spirit of God begins to move through the congregation, we look at a soloist and we think, my, aren't they anointed? Or we hear a preacher preaching a word and we say, wow, what an anointed life. What a disciplined life. What an anointing on them. I beg to differ. The release of power that fills the house is not simply based upon the dedicated life of the individual. But when the choir begins to sing something, Something we agree on. When they begin to sing about the name of Jesus, power in the name, there seems to be a release of divine healing and presence. It's not that someone has a personal anointing. It's that they're singing something we agree with. 
And when you and I begin to partner our faith in agreement, there is a release of power in the kingdom of God like no other. That's why the writer said one puts a thousand and two can put ten thousand. I'm pretty powerful by myself. I have authority and dominion in the spirit. But I am so much better when somebody takes my hand and says, Preacher, I got your back. I'm with you on this one. I'll pray and I'll fast till something happens. One puts a thousand. Two, we are exponentially better when we're together. You ought to grab someone's hand and say in the name of Jesus right now. That's why you can preach a great anointed word. And if there is no agreement in the house, it will fall without recourse, without power, and without healing. But if you're preaching something and the congregation agrees with you, there is a release of supernatural healing and deliverance that fills the house. I'm here to preach to some people that this Jesus, who has no comparable equal... This Jesus can do anything right now. If you believe that, you ought to worship with me right now. Let your faith rise for just a moment. If we can ever get together... You say, preacher, I I just came to sing. I I just came to praise the Lord. I I I just came to the house of God for social interaction. Well, I didn't. I can praise God by myself. I can praise him in my pajamas. I I can get my praise on driving down the road in the car. I really don't need you to help me worship. I I need you to agree with me. I I need you to run in the house and say, God has no limitations. Healing is possible. Deliverance is viable. I need someone to come in the house of God and say, anything is possible. You need someone to rip the roof off and let you down to Jesus. You need a partner who'll come alongside you and say, I believe. You ought to tell, grab somebody's hand and tell the devil to get out of their house right now. You ought to rebuke the spirit of affliction off of them right now. You ought to command their family to find peace in the name of Jesus. Go ahead, go ahead, do it right now. That's why it matters where you go to church. I came to get a word from God. I came to find someone of like precious faith who believes that there is no obstacle that cannot be removed by the power of the precious name of Jesus. I didn't come to have a good time. I didn't come just to rub shoulders with friends. I came to see God do the miraculous. You have to immerse yourself in an environment with other believers who have the concept and the reality that God is capable of fixing anything. Let me make sure you understand. Something is supposed to happen when we get together. Mary has the gift of God in her life. The Spirit has conceived something in her spirit. What is in her is not of man, it's of God. And when Mary, who has no one she has anything in common with, when Mary knocks on the house of Elizabeth, the Scripture says that the child in Elizabeth had not moved for months. But when Mary knocked on the door of Elizabeth's house, the Scripture said that the womb, the child in the womb of Elizabeth, leapt had not moved for months when the gift in me gets near the gift in you something ought to move when my faith gets near your faith when my walk with God sidles up near yours something ought to interact you ought to feel hope that's why if you're not sitting by someone that makes you believe God can do anything find another seat 
something is supposed to happen. When we walk at New Life Austin on a Sunday night, we're not going through the motions. When what I possess gets near what you possess, something ought to leap in your spirit. It wasn't the individual anointing on Paul and Silas singing at midnight. It was their togetherness in the common calamity of being locked away in prison. But when they began to worship together. Raise your hands and release an earthquake right now. Raise your hands and invite God into your situation right now. You need someone to tell the devil, get out of your house. You need someone to kick the laughers out and lay hands on your dead and dying daughter. You need someone that'll grab your hand and say, I believe anything's possible. The enemy doesn't especially mind you talking in tongues, but he resists your ability to connect. If you can't get along with people, your growth is stunted. And you cannot be the person God is calling you to be if you're in conflict with people all the time. For most of the blessings in your life will come through the connections of other people. We have every ingredient for the miraculous right now tonight. And it will come through partnered faith. Look on us! So convinced were they of what they possessed. Look on us! Alms was his petition. Alms! Look on us! Look on us! And he expecting to receive something of them. Are we convinced we have the answer for Austin? Are you convinced you have the answer for your children? your relatives, your co-workers, and your neighbors. God, give us a revival of confidence that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is all this world needs. Silver and gold, have I none? Silver and gold, have I none? Why are we so quick to answer the needs of people with physical solutions? I believe in clothing them. I believe in feeding them. I believe in being kind to those who are less fortunate. But can I be very frank right now? The reason why the religious world is answering them with food and with wells, with blankets and sleeping bags, is because they're not convinced what they have is the answer. But if we ever get convinced the Holy Ghost is enough, I believe in compassion-based ministries. But don't you forget the eternal soul must be saved. You cannot give away what you do not possess. Silver and gold. Have I none? But such as I have, give I thee. You cannot speak peace into someone's life if you don't possess peace. You cannot release healing into someone's life if you do not possess faith. That's why it's imperative there be a conviction, a renewal and a revival of just who God is. That's why you got to understand the Holy Ghost is not just an emotion. It's more than a feeling. It's more than a language or a goosebump that happens in an altar in an apostolic church. It is God taking up residence within the confines of the human soul. Look on us. Redirect your eyes from your rags to your redeemer. Look on us. Shift your perspective tonight. Shift your perspective tonight. Such as I have, give I thee. Give I thee. It's the lesson of the first church. It's the principles and orders that the miraculous for the rest of time will operate under the confines of unity. In disunity, there is no miraculous. I could verify this throughout the New Testament when Jesus kicks them laughers out of the house and he only takes into the house the mother and the father and his inner circle of disciples because there is only the supernatural found when unity fills the house. 
That's why repentance will always precede healing. That's why repentance precedes the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And until we have a repented spirit, there is no healing and deliverance. If you go to Matthew 18 and you back up a few scriptures from the verse 19 that we quoted, that passage is about agreement within the house of God and dealing with conflict amongst believers. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost is about to interrupt us right now. But why the gate? Why there? Why? Why the beautiful gate? Why this gate, this gorgeous place in front of this traditional religion? Why there? Why the lame man? Why is he the first miraculous manifestation? Why him? You see, ancient Israel believed that disease, imperfection, and disability was because of sin in your life or on the part of your ancestors. Perhaps a demon or perhaps the judgment of God. You were considered unclean, an outcast, ostracized and alienated from the religious experience. You could not enter the tabernacle nor the temple. You could not take place in the ritual sanctification or in the worship of Almighty God. The principles in Leviticus chapter 21 Unclean were the lame. That's why when David goes to Jerusalem to take Jerusalem from the Jebusites, the Jebusites put the lame and the halt in his way. And then they jeered and mocked him and said, even the lame and the blind can defend this city from you. Because you see, David valued the house of God. For it was David that penned the words in Psalms 122 and 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Why? Why does David value it? Why? Why does David speak a word that seems so callous and create a Davidic tradition? For he said, The man who goes up and smiteth the lame and the halt shall be a chief and a captain. For the blind and the lame are hated of David's soul. Why would King David utter such a callous word? You see, he understood what it was like to be on the outside looking in. For the scripture teaches us an eternal truth in Deuteronomy 23 and 8. That if you married a Moabite, you could not enter the temple for 10 generations. Your children could not enter the temple for three generations. Perhaps now you remember that Boaz married Ruth, a Moabite. Perhaps you can remember that Boaz and Ruth had a boy named Obed. And Obed begat a son named Jesse. And Jesse had a boy named David. You see, David was unwilling to let anything defile his ability to worship for he got to go where his dad couldn't go. He got to worship where his grandfather couldn't go. He got to dance where his great-granddaddy couldn't go. No wonder he said. Psalms 122 and 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go. And the Jebusites understood that if he touched the lame and the halt, he was defiled and he lost his ability to worship. So David says, whoever's willing to fight him, go and fight him. I'll make you a chief and a captain, but I am not about to touch them. I've come too far to lose this worship experience. And a Davidic tradition is born. Now it's not happenstance, nor is it accidental that the first miracle finds a lame man outside the gate, not allowed to go, unable to enter to have a worship experience. And he spends his life, alms, alms, 
alms. But lame expectations are about to encounter an apostolic authority and anointing. And here they come together. Alms, alms. Do you understand what I'm preaching? That the first miracle teaches us that the supernatural happens by our togetherness. But the principle that is established in Acts chapter 3 is that anyone is welcome in this apostolic experience. There is no one that is ostracized, that is alienated, or that is banished. There is no one in this house that cannot receive the Holy Ghost right now. There is no one in this house who cannot receive a miracle in your body right now. Regardless of the failure, the mistakes, the attitudes, the sin nature. Oh, no matter your past, your lineage, or your heritage. What Acts 3 is about is the simple reality. All of us are welcome here. Put your hands in the air right now. The Spirit's about to fill this house. So go ahead and bring your divorce tonight. Bring your mistakes. Bring your confusions. Bring your, uh, uh, all of your issues and attitudes. Uh, bring your inconsistencies and your questions, your doubts and your fears. The Spirit of God is welcoming you right now. Stand to your feet with me. Raise your hands and worship him. Would you do that? All are welcome here. All So what does Acts 3 teach us conclusively? That the supernatural operates on the premise of faith, togetherness, confidence, and that anyone can receive. So here's what's about to happen. I need you to go find someone who you know needs a miracle, a healing, a deliverance, a financial blessing, They've never received the gift of the Spirit. But you know that God will do it for them tonight. And I need you to go find someone and grab their hand and bring them to this altar right now. Go ahead. Find them. Search them out. Move out of your comfort zone, saint. There's no secrets in this house. You know each other's business. You know who's sick, who's struggling. It's so easy sometimes to just move and grab your spouse or grab someone you sit by. But move across the auditorium. Find someone nearby. Find someone that you haven't seen break through in the altar in a long time. Hurry. Everybody ought to be bringing someone. There you go. Keep coming. Just don't stop. Don't stop at the back of the altar. Move all the way to the front. There's many coming. We want to create room. I would display my authority and my dominion in your life tonight if you would only believe. Lay aside the differences, the hesitation, and the fears that shadow and frustrate your faith. Take someone and partner with them for the miraculous, and I will show my spirit tonight. If I was you, I would do just that right now. If you're still in the pew, I'd move and find someone to agree with right now.
If you know how to pray, it's time to pray. There you go. Hallelujah. Come on, let it fall. Let it fall. Let it fall. Let it fall. Just a minute. I'll tell you when in just a minute. Hallelujah. You can play softly, but I'll just tell you when in a few minutes, okay? Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the yes, ma'am, receive the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead. Say, habla. Yes, sir, just raise that hand right there. In the name of Jesus, by the authority of thy divine name, uh, by the sovereignty of thy spirit, you carry out that that the high be loose right now by the healing virtue of Almighty God. Yeah, open your mouth and let the Spirit intercede on your behalf. There you go, talk in tongues. Yes! Let me have your attention for just a moment. Let me have your attention. I want to pray with direction. There you go. There you go. I'm going to release you to pray in just a moment. Don't worry. We're not hindering. We're going to help. Hallelujah. Give me a little juice. Hallelujah. Let me have your attention. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, just go ahead then. Lay hands on somebody and tell them to be healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me have your attention, new life. Turn your eyes this way for just a moment. Does anyone in this house believe healing is about to fall on us as a people of God? Can you hear me out there? Can you hear me? If you believe healing's about to come, I want you to raise your hand and in faith, I want you to bear witness of that fact and I want you to tell the Lord, I believe there is healing in this house. Tell him right now. Proclaim your faith. Silent faith moves no mountains. There you go. Now listen closely. Listen closely. I'm going to do very similar to this morning. I'm going to lead you through a prayer of repentance. Some of you, you may have never asked God to forgive you. You're going to ask. Others you've asked many times. And some you simply haven't asked in a little while. But we're going to repent together as a church family. And as we repent, forgiveness is going to fall. Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful name
books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, 